Hey, this is Derek. Um, I'm working on my book, Bookcraft. I'm not actually down at the nonfiction part yet. I'm doing a lot of the heavy fiction stuff, but I just came up with an idea that will probably turn into a headline, and I wanted to make a quick video about it in case I talk about it later. I like to make videos when I have an idea to kind of chronicle the moment. Um, I'll extend it and expand it and figure out how it works later, but the idea was basically this. When you're writing a nonfiction book, a lot of the nonfiction books that I've read, especially in the self-help or spirituality category, um, are kind of info dumps without a lot of life lessons. So stuff that you could find by quoting, you know, inspirational quotes, and then you put all those in your book, stuff that you could discover from watching a Tony Robbins seminar or a bunch of YouTube videos. Um, most of it is like second-hand awareness where people, thought leaders have come into the space since like the 70s and they've preached positive thinking, self-awareness. Um, there have been lots of other books that have had steps forward by qualified experts who build a platform around what they're teaching and it's trickled down to regular people so that regular people have some idea about all this stuff, but they've learned it, they haven't earned it, which means not only did they not go through the suffering and the pain that took them to have the epiphany where they discovered something new. So to discover, to discover new knowledge, you have to, there's a cost. There's always a cost to new knowledge, which means someone has to dive into the depths do the research, spend 10 years in the library, and figure out. We used to do this with my PhD thesis. This is the um, literature review. You have to know everything in detail to figure out if anyone said it before. And if someone said it before, there's nothing worth saying in your thesis. You don't have a thesis because a thesis is something that moves the research forward. You have to do the research and know everything about, not everything about everything, but everything about one specific subject so that you can quote and reference all those other people, but you can make sure that your book has new information and a new message, um, which is not just, and it could be just that you've done a lot of research. Um, part of what I'm struggling with in this book is Bookcraft, is I have a ton of historical trivia and quotes that I've rediscovered that are not popularly known. So it's exciting for me to share that stuff, um, but it's not stuff you can just find on the internet. It's stuff I had to really work to find and track down. Um, and then I don't just dump it, you know, in my book. I have to figure out how can I organize all this information in a long form article or chapter that takes readers on the right kind of learning path where I present all this new information because I'm making one large article step by step, um, which means, for example, the articles, the stuff I'm struggling with is stuff about like um, feeling comfortable selling your books for money, feeling comfortable with um, writing craft versus writing magic, which means learning new things and structures and tools and resources and, you know, a process to your writing instead of just going into it blind and being a discovery writer. Um, I have to not only show people how to do that, I have to convince them that there is a way to do that and that it's worthwhile and that it's not um, an ethical cop-out. There's a weird thing in literature, literary circles, where people think when you learn the craft, you're selling out um, and it leads to less magic and also less satisfaction or appreciation from readers, bizarrely, even if readers don't like it and the books don't sell and the books don't earn, a lot of writers still say those books that have the magic are still more valuable than the books that actually sell that readers love. Anyway, that's one of the big things I have to try to address. I have to present all this information in a logical argument to, and I talk about this in the book, in detail about how to write a nonfiction book, but um, I have to start out by guessing what their objections are going to be and dismantling their objections. So if I present my case, you know, bookcraft is the craft and art and magic of writing, the history and the process, that's the whole thing. 
they're immediately going to come back with questions. When I introduce new information, their um, preconceived biases and, and, you know, everything they've learned in their life is going to come back and it's going to get their hackles up or they'll be skeptical of my message. I want to make sure we're on the same page by pointing out, I like, you may be feeling this way. If you're feeling this way, that's great, that's natural, that's fine. It's because of all of this stuff that you've been told. Um, I have to let them know I understand their objections, but I also have experience and evidence that provides them with a new, fresh angle. I'm not just dismissing or ignoring their objections. Um, I see them and I'm still going to take them into consideration when I move forward. This got kind of lengthy, but my point was, um, first, you can't just collect a whole bunch of internet knowledge. You have to do real research if you want to present something new. Um, second, you need to have a theme. It can't just be improve yourself, self-help, um, you know, or positive thinking. You have to get a lot more specific. You have to present something new. You have to take all of your new information and research and knowledge and you have to put it into a new framework around a new theme that has a strong hook that goes with the title and the subtitle. Um, I'm leaning into mine because mine was basically bookcraft. I couldn't find a better title at the time and it was good enough. And I've since discovered that the point of my book, which was just about the craft and the, you know, how to write well um, writing stuff, but because of the title bookcraft and the subtitle, which was cut the fluff, keep the magic, because I knew people were going to be sensitive to me saying, um, basically craft is more important than magic. That was what I was originally saying. It's not what I'm saying anymore. I think craft is the process to discover a deeper sense of the magic of writing that readers already love. So rather than taking what they love away from them, I'm saying you can keep what you love and I'm going to double it with these strategies. Um, it's really about, you know, understanding not only what you want to teach, but what your audience is able and what they need to hear. Um, I can't just give them the tactics because if they aren't able to receive them and use them, they're not going to do anybody any good. I have to figure out who my audience is and what they're capable of listening to. And I hate saying that because I used to think this is not my responsibility at all. I just want to share the tips and the knowledge. Um, but I've come to realize if you write nonfiction, it's your job to get their motivation and their buy-in and their belief and to overcome the objections and, um, and get them to take what you have to make them receptive to what you're going to say and listen and pay attention to what you are going to say before you say it. When you just start dumping the information, they don't care about it yet. They don't think it's valuable yet. Um, this is the same thing I teach people in fiction writing where you can't just give the backstory or the reveals or the why. You have to make readers ask the questions first. And there's a process, an order to when you reveal the things. Um, the other thing that was kind of cool that I came up with today, similarly with nonfiction, a lot of what I talk about in Bookcraft is it's kind of like a magic trick. Um, it looks like magic to readers, but it's not really. Of course, it's a trick. That's the craft versus the magic. The magic is what happens when readers are reading it. The craft is what the author is doing behind the scenes so that readers always feel and experience that desired effect. Um, so what I came up with, or one of the new subheadings I came up with in the book is something like um, razzle dazzle. Razzle dazzle is what you want to do in the introduction. You want to get their attention by doing showy, flashy things. And then the abracadabra. The abracadabra is the final reveal. In the middle is the entire story. If you just did the abracadabra with no story, um, it wouldn't mean anything to readers. If you just show someone a magic trick, they'll be like, cool, how'd you do that? It doesn't have the same effect. The effect comes in the story, you know, when you talk about for 180 pages, when people can see how you got there, and then you do the big reveal, it has so much more resonance and emotional impact. So that's kind of a neat framing device. Um, but this video specifically was about learning versus earning. So I already kind of mentioned a couple of them, um, which is that you have to have unique information and knowledge that's not just commonly available. You can't just be consolidating a bunch of 
things that people have already heard before, you also have to frame it um, in a new theme or container with a new argument that leads them to understand why your new version of this stuff hasn't been said before and is necessary. And finally, you have to show that you've done the work, that you have, I don't like saying suffered for your art because I don't believe that's true. Um, I think it is true that you have to do the work to learn and become proficient in your craft. But for nonfiction stuff especially, you usually have to show, you have to show your work, um, which I also, I'm shaking my head because I also used to hate that in English class or in math class, I could do the work immediately. Teachers wanted to see that you got there the right way. So you'd have to show your steps. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know how it's related to, you know, how it works with teachers, but unfortunately with nonfiction books, that's kind of also true. If you just tell readers, here's some stuff I found, they're not going to value it. You have to tell it in a personal framework that shows you have suffered or triumphed or persevered. Like this knowledge was not easy to come by. Um, and I say something like that at the front of my new preface to Book Magic, which is, um, which almost felt a little showy. I don't like being showy with my writing, but I said something in the new preface that I'm testing out, which was something like, you know, this knowledge cost me two decades and a PhD in literature and a hundred books, a thousand books, um, however many. I've investigated, I've researched, um, and not only saying that, but really showing, you know, I'm introducing readers to all of this new content that's not available. I've obviously done my research, so I want to be clear about that, but also just saying, you know, this knowledge is valuable. I worked hard for this knowledge. It's not for everybody. Not everybody's ready to hear it, but it might be right for you. Something like that to get their buy-in and just to kind of get them to expect valuable content or information from the book. Um, so that's something, I mean, in my book, in Bookcraft, I talk a lot in the nonfiction section about how to do your introduction, your preface, your first chapter. Um, and I have rules and structures about how to do that. But you also need at some point some personal branding, which means... And I also didn't like doing this at all um, with my art. I wanted the art to be about the art. I wanted the content or the information to stand for itself. I didn't want to talk about me because I didn't think it was relevant. Um, but it is because people won't listen to you if they don't like you and if they don't trust you. So you have to show them you understand where they're coming from. You have struggled for this information um, and now you want to share it. There is a place in your book to be really clear about that journey and to make it as vivid and descriptive as possible um, because that's going to get their emotional buy-in to value the information that you're presenting. You have to have good information. It can't just be stuff you grab on the internet or stuff that you just, stuff that you just think or feel. Um, I'm smiling because there's other things I want to say, but I don't think I'll say them in this video. But you've consumed a lot of knowledge in your lifetime. You've probably made some personal discoveries about things that you believe or don't believe. Um, but that's probably not pioneering new work. You've probably read a bunch of books or watched a bunch of movies. Probably there's a million people out there just like you who have come to similar conclusions. So you want to make sure if you're writing a book, if you're teaching something, it has to be something new that you have discovered that is not just out there. It could also just be like you're great at research and you've organized all of this research, but it should really still have some component of this was my personal journey. This is why I started researching this information. This is why it's so important. This is what I learned from it. People like to see that rags to riches, you know, I was just like you, but then I discovered this one thing and then everything changed. It can seem manipulative or dodgy. Um, you, you see it a lot in like sales videos and, and webinars and stuff, but it works in a nonfiction book. Even if you're not selling anything, you are trying to get readers to pay attention, to trust and like you and to read it. Um, anyway, this is a long winded video. I talked about a lot of stuff in regards to nonfiction. 
I have a lot more in the book, which is Bookcraft that I'm working on. Um, you can find it on Amazon. And there's three writing courses that I'm going to bundle with that book because I think the book is going to be so valuable. I really just want to get it out to as many people as possible. So this is just kind of an early share of something I wanted to talk about. I tend to have kind of brain fart ideas where I'll get the perfect header, but I won't know what it means yet. And if I make a video and talk about it, I may accidentally stumble into new facets of that idea and it helps me go back and write the idea better once I've talked it through and I understand it a little bit better. So if this video seems a little disjointed or I'm rambling, which is actually pretty common for my YouTube videos, um, hopefully I also mentioned some things that are important. But I thought it was a neat insight. Um, did you learn it or did you earn it? I don't think I've heard anything like that before when people talk about nonfiction books. So I'm always excited when I think of a new, not just, I mean, I have tons of content about how to write nonfiction, but when you can boil down complicated topics into a really clear, obvious rule, you know, one thing, easy to remember thing, um, that has a lot of value and packs a really deep punch and people can really understand it on a on a effective pragmatic level that means they'll be able to start using it sooner and that's really what my book and my teaching is all about um, there's a lot of deep stuff but mostly I just want you to write better books as quickly as possible so I'm trying to boil it down into clear and easy rules anyway let me know if you like that idea learn it or earn it or if you have other comments about writing nonfiction. Um, or questions in the comments. Bye-bye.